Coming up, stress less, do more. Mark Batterson shares how to win the day. Then, see how one man defied an empire. Rome at this point in time was really a cesspool of immoral behavior. And taught the world about true love. And it will become a witness of what enduring love could look like. Meet the real St. Valentine. We should celebrate what true sacrificial love looks like in a broken world. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Do we have a cure for COVID? Well, that's what doctors in Israel believe they may have found through an experimental drug. They also say they can supply the entire world with it in a matter of a few months. So what is this new drug? How does it work? And why do doctors have such high hopes for it? Chris Mitchell brings us the good news from Jerusalem. Sonia Cohen could one day be seen as a walking miracle. I want to say thank you for everything. You saved my life. I was in a poor condition and now I'm better. Coming to the hospital with COVID-19, she was unable to breathe. She was placed in intensive care and needed oxygen. That's when Professor Nadir Arbor came to her and asked if she would be part of a clinical trial for a new drug. Sonia said yes. From the first dose of the trial drug, it's possible to say I felt a lot better. After two days, I got off the oxygen in stages and I could breathe. I could really breathe. I felt that I was between life and death, thanks to God and, of course, thanks to the doctors. Doctors at Ikolov Hospital believe they may have found a cure for the COVID-19 virus. They say just five doses from a little bottle could end the worldwide pandemic. So this is a drug. It is very simple. You give it to patients, to patients with severe disease before they're going to deteriorate into very severe disease that mandate ventilations and even mortality. Professor Arbor is director of research on developing the anti-coronavirus drug EXO-CD24, a treatment derived from a cell line established from a child aborted decades ago. We don't really treat the corona, we treat it the endpoint. There is overreactions of the immune system. The immune system is acting furiously and mainly in the lung releasing a lot of cytokines and chemokines that usually fight infections, but now they're destroying the lung tissue. That's the point they intervene and administer their treatment, which Arbor says interrupts the cytokine storm. And we give it by inhalation. It's very simple. It's like two to three minutes per day, and you do it for five days. So we enrolled 30 patients in the phase one. We checked for safety, and the drug was very safe, no side effects whatsoever. All 30 patients in that phase one trial recovered. And most of them went home after three to five days. While Arbor believes the vaccination push is important, he also feels this drug could have an even bigger impact if the remaining two phases of the important human trials are successful. The biggest advantage of my drug, if it's effective, of course, is that I can produce it fast, efficient and cheap. Within a few months, I can supply the entire world needs. Arbor recently briefed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the treatment's progress. Later, at a press conference with the visiting Greek Prime Minister, Netanyahu praised the results and reported Greek hospitals would join in the clinical trials. If you're infected by corona and you're seriously ill and you have a lung problem, you take this, you inhale this with a saline solution and you come out feeling good. Arbor says many more countries want to participate, and he believes this could be just the beginning. And then it's going to be the platform for many other diseases with overreaction, like auto autoimmune disease in the lung and the entire body. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, that's wonderful news coming out of Israel. Israel truly is fulfilling the promise that it will be a light to the nations. Uh, wonderful inventions coming out of Israel. And the good news here is that even though the initial drug was developed with fetal cells, you can, now that it's proven, you don't have to use those fetal cells in order to make more doses of it, which is really, really good news. Here at home, more promising news in the fight against the coronavirus. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? 
That's right, Gordon. President Biden says the country will have enough vaccines for 300 million Americans by summer's end. Not only that, people who've been vaccinated may not have to quarantine if they're exposed to the virus. CBN's Eric Phillips has the story. The president is sounding quite hopeful because the U.S. is on track to exceed his goal of administering 100 million vaccine doses in his first 100 days in office. 26 million shots have already been given in his first three weeks. That's despite, he says, inheriting a pandemic without a plan. During a visit to the National Institutes of Health Thursday, the president announced the U.S. has secured commitments for 200 million more doses of the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna to be delivered by the end of July. Biden also said 100 million doses that had been promised by June will now arrive in May. That's a month faster. That means lives will be saved. A grand total of 600 million doses for the U.S., with each American needing two shots. That means we're now on track to have enough supply for 300 million Americans by the end of July. My predecessor, be very blunt about it, did not do his job in getting ready for the massive challenge of vaccinating hundreds of millions of Americans. More promising news, as Dr. Fauci says, eligibility should soon open up to any American who wants to be vaccinated. I would imagine by the time we get to April, that will be what I would call for, you know, for better wording, open season, namely virtually everybody and anybody in any category could start to get vaccinated. The Biden administration has deployed active duty troops to help stand up vaccination sites in several states in anticipation of increased supply. But for now, frustration as people scramble to get inoculated amid what is still a vaccine crunch. It's ridiculous. 30 degree weather. There were people in wheelchairs, walkers. This is ridiculous. The current shortage forcing hard hit L.A. to shut down a few vaccination sites for a few days as the California variant ricochets across the state and the country. We don't have enough vaccines. Our vaccine supply is uneven. It's unpredictable and too often inequitable. Meanwhile, the CDC says once people have been fully vaccinated, they no longer have to quarantine if they are exposed to the COVID-19 virus. But officials caution that for now, they still should wear masks. The bottom line is this, masks work and they work best when they have a good fit and are worn correctly. Where schools are concerned, the White House says it will follow new guidelines expected to come today from the CDC on when and how to reopen schools. This after critics say the president has been backing away from his pledge to open a majority of schools in his first 100 days in office. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. Lawyers for former President Trump get their turn today after congressional impeachment managers finish making their case in the Senate impeachment trial. Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson tells us what to expect from the defense today. President Trump's lawyers plan to argue Trump's speech on January 6th is protected by the First Amendment. And if they charge him, other lawmakers are guilty, too. I can give you Chuck Schumer's words when he stood in front of a mob in front of the Supreme Court and he said, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, you've unleashed the whirlwind and you will pay the price. Republican Senator Rand Paul tells CBN News he doesn't believe Trump's speech incited the Capitol riot. If we're going to judge political speech on the actual words, let's use one standard. And I think Democrats would find if they look in the mirror, they've been guilty of much more than they're accusing Trump of. House impeachment managers spent two days making their case that President Trump's violent rhetoric led to the attack. This was not a hidden crime. The president told them to be there, and so they actually believed they would face no punishment. And argued once the attack started, he did nothing to stop it. Why did President Trump not tell his supporters to stop the attack on the Capitol as soon as he learned of it? Why did President Trump do nothing to stop the attack for at least two hours after the attack began? And showed no remorse. People thought that what I said was totally appropriate. GOP Senator Bill Cassidy told reporters Thursday he wants the defense to address Trump's actions once the siege began. The president was calling to try and get more senators to decertify the election. Now. Presumably, since we were at that point 
being evacuated, and I think he was told that. Um, there was some awareness of the events. And so what I hope the defense does is explain that. He also wants them to address Trump's repeated claims the election was stolen. So when the point was made, people felt as if they had no recourse because their vote was being stolen. Well, the president built that story. So how do you defend that? How do you describe that? Because again, people will still be telling me that Dominion rigged the machines. Even with GOP senators like Cassidy weighing a possible vote to convict, Senator Paul believes the prosecution is nowhere close to convincing the 17 Republicans needed to bar Trump from seeking federal office again. So there'll be 44, 45 people to acquit. It'll be a largely partisan exercise. It will have destroyed any possible unifying uh, concept that President Biden may have wished for, but it was his own doing. The defense is expected to only take one day to present their case, and the final vote on whether or not to convict could come as early as this weekend. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thank you, Abby. Gordon, back to you. Well, I think the vote's already established, and, and we're already going to see an acquittal. They don't have enough votes to actually convict. So this is essentially a, a show trial, but it is being watched. The ratings for this are actually more than the ratings for the previous uh, impeachment trial. So people are seeing new things and new videos being released. But still, at the end of the day, uh, former President Trump will be acquitted. Terry? Well, still ahead, Valentine's Day. Guess what? It's not really about romance. So what is it about? Meet the real St. Valentine and find out. That's coming up. Plus, waving Christian flags, praying in the Senate chamber, all part of the mob action that breached the Capitol. What's behind this new wave of Christian nationalism? And why is it so dangerous? Your news channel, your shows, the stories you care about. Anytime you want, anywhere you want. Download the CBN News app today. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies, but we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. So I want to invite you to watch our program on cbnfamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Monday. I did not know what was going to happen. Sentence to hard time. It's like that real walking dead. One teen gets 30 years behind bars. Seasons of um, depression and despair. For a crime he didn't commit. Asking God to get me out of this because I didn't do this. What set him free? Virginia got this wrong. Next week on The 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Are waving Jesus flags, praying in the breach Senate chamber. These actions by the mob make the horror of the Capitol invasion even more troubling. They reflect a political ideology. It's uh, being called Christian nationalism. Uh, so what exactly is it and how did it become so dangerous? Well, Heather Sells explains. On January 6th, Thousands of Christians came to Washington to support President Donald Trump and to pray. Later, however, many unwittingly found themselves in a crowd that would march on the Capitol and eventually breach the building, leaving two dead and more than 100 police officers injured. I think it's the most shocking failure of security imaginable. Many, including Capitol Police and Congressman Adam Kinzinger, described what felt like spiritual warfare. I just felt a real dark, a real darkness over this place, like a real evil. 
Disobeying and assaulting police is a sin, whether it's done by Antifa or by angry Republicans. Doubly disturbing, the mob's use of Christian symbols, such as these flags and praying in the Senate chamber. Fair warning, this video is hard to watch. Jesus Christ, we invoke your name. Amen. Amen. Let's all say a prayer in this sacred space. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for gracing us with this opportunity. Christian leaders have been quick to condemn the display. There is no such thing as a righteous riot. It is the equivalent of someone breaking into a bank and asking God to bless the heist. This is a fringe, radical group with a religious zeal that comes with a myopic worldview. To understand how and why this could happen, Georgetown professor and InterVarsity Press author Paul Miller says it's important to understand Christian so, nationalism. Uh, nationalism is very popular on the political right. It has eclipsed what I would call conservatism. Christian nationalism as a political ideology is not drawn directly from the Bible. It borrows a lot of Christian words and symbols and rhetoric, which is why it can be confusing for some Christians. Christian nationalism is different from patriotism or love of country. It is a political view that asserts that the U.S. was and must remain a Christian nation, with other faiths taking a back seat on issues like religious liberty. Religious liberty, to be true and, and consistent, needs to be relig religious liberty for everyone. It's not religious liberty for me, but not for thee. Southern Baptist Albert Moeller warns against nationalism infused with any racial superiority or that becomes an idol in our lives and can lead us away from our faith. That kind of nationalism, even though it may claim a religious identity up front, it will eventually show itself to be idolatrous. If it requires me to deny Christ or, or forbids me to follow Christ obediently, then I will no longer pledge allegiance to that flag. I have no ultimate allegiance to that flag. Conspiracy theories can also fuel Christian nationalism, and we've seen them seep into some evangelical circles. Half of U.S. Protestant pastors report it's entered their churches, according to new research by LifeWay. It's why leaders are calling on their flocks to search out the truth. You should be able to validate uh, what you share, what you spread. When we're gullible and easily fooled, when we're the people who are posting conspiracies and the next thing saying, oh, the resurrection's true, all those conspiracies are too, it undermines our witness. Miller encourages pastors to help their congregations focus on their heavenly citizenship above all else. Suarez says that can apply to the prophetic world as well. I need to make sure that as a believer, as a Christian, that I'm more kingdom-minded than I am American-minded. We need to, as, as prophetic people, we need to re-examine and wonder why is it that we're only getting prophetic words about American elections? Ultimately, the local church can provide what many have lost, which is part of what's fueling political extremism. There are many people in America who feel lonely, isolated, alienated. And in that isolation, they're gravitating towards the conspiracy theories. They're gravitating towards perhaps militia movements. They're gravitating towards extremer ideologies like nationalism because it gives them a sense of belonging and purpose. That belonging is harder to find in a pandemic, yet may be more important than ever. Heather Sells, CBN News. I think it's more important than ever to understand our own history. And you look at these movements and you go, how in the world did you become so unhinged? How can a bison-headed shaman ever pretend to be a, a Christian? It makes no sense to me. Uh, and for him to even claim that is just bizarre. Is there a Christian thread that goes throughout our history? And the answer is decided yes. Whether you look at the documents of the Virginia Company that, that uh, established the, the colony of Virginia, or you look at the Mayflower Compact, which established the colony of Massachusetts, you see proclamations that they want to be an example to the world of what can happen to a people who follow the commandments of God Almighty. And that God that they're worshiping is a Judeo-Christian God. They're not worshiping other gods. They're 
they're saying we're a Christian people. You look at 1783 and the Ezra Stiles sermon to uh, the, the newly elected Connecticut legislature and to the newly elected Governor John Trumbull. That sermon talking about American excellence, that America is being elevated by God to a position of honor uh, so that the world could know what would happen when a people fully dedicate themselves to following him. You look at 1861, a newly elected Abraham Lincoln as president trying to unify the company and calling America God's almost chosen people, which is a significant phrase, almost chosen. But throughout all of that thread is a, another thread that they know the dangers of an established religion. They had come out of a Europe with established churches. They had seen the corruption of that. And when you don't have freedom of conscience, when you don't have the ability to worship God the way you want to worship God, well, then you're going to have some very extreme problems with an established church trying to crack down on so-called heretics. And what does that mean? And they firmly rejected it. They created a secular state and said Congress can never pass a law respecting the establishment of religion. At the same time, they respected and protected religious belief and expression. That same Congress can't pass any law prohibiting the free exercise of religion or prohibiting assembly. So this is the legacy that we have inherited. We need to protect that legacy. And we need to reject all of these wacko conspiracy theories that are coming up and realize, can we come together? Can we respect our democratic institutions? Can we respect our elections? Uh, can we have confidence in them going forward? Uh, there have been several shots in my lifetime. You go back to 2000, the Supreme Court had to tell us who won that election. Uh, can we come together, come into agreement, and say we are one nation under God, that's a key part, one nation under God, indivisible, and then with liberty and justice for all. Can we not make that aspirational? Can we make it real and leave a legacy to our children, our grandchildren? We have inherited something fantastic. Let us preserve it for the generations to come. Terry? Well, coming up, why do we exchange cards on Valentine's Day? And who was beheaded on February 14th? We have these answers and more about the real St. Valentine when we come back. Do you want to know more about having a relationship with God? Call us at 1-800-700-7000. A story has inspired the world for thousands of years. While some scholars doubted his very existence. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. This is ancient, biblical Jerusalem. CBN Films presents Written in Stone, House of David. For centuries, the Bible was the only evidence that David existed. Written in Stone, House of David, coming soon from CBN Films. Well, Valentine's Day is coming, and some people love it. Others dread it. Either way, most people think of it as a celebration of romance with flowers, candy, and cards. In reality, Valentine's Day is rooted in something entirely different. For many people, Valentine's Day is all about romance. If you may ask the person in the street, what does Valentine's Day mean to you? All it means is heart-shaped boxes of chocolates and a nice dinner with your, with your beloved and, and sending cards and so forth. And then if they didn't know about a St. Valentine, they probably wouldn't realize that he was a priest in the late third century in Rome who was actually martyred for the faith. Very often, legends will develop from real facts. There's that little phrase in, in J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings where he says, uh, history became legend and legend became myth. The legend of St. Valentine is a story that is rooted in fact. 
there are three stories surrounding him and they all agree on a number of issues. It seemed that he was born in 226 in a tiny little city called Terni in Umbria in Italy and that he was either a priest or a bishop. Valentine apparently lived during the reign of the Emperor Claudius II. He's sometimes referred to as Claudius Gothicus. Now, this emperor did not reign for very long, maybe a year and a half. Rome at this point in time was really a cesspool of immoral behavior. Pedophilia was rife. Sexual promiscuity was rife. And, and one of the great witnesses of the early church is that they stood up for the value of a godly marriage where uh, sexuality was channeled into its God-given um, boundaries and it would become a witness of what enduring love could look like. During his reign, Claudius issued an edict that made marriage illegal. There was an invasion of Goths towards Rome and they needed a lot of people to go to war. And it seemed that the rule was that once you were married, you were given freedom not to go to war. And um, Valentine would not only convert the people, but secretly marry them so that they could indeed stay at home. Valentine was arrested and brought to Rome. While he was being held captive, he presented the gospel to his jailer, the judge Asterius. So the judge said to him, well, if this indeed is true, I want you to prove it. And he brought one of his adopted daughters who happened to be blind, the one legend says. And what happened is that Valentinus or Valentine here laid his hands upon this girl and she was healed immediately. Another legend says that before he was executed, he left a note for the girl signed, your Valentine. Some say this led to the practice of sending Valentines on February 14th, the day he was beheaded. All the legends seem to agree that uh, Valentine was martyred on the 14th of February in 269. Therefore, that was the day associated with him when the church would celebrate and, and thank God for his life. So Valentine's Day didn't start out as a romantic holiday. We do need to recognize that this day, the 14th of February, was already connected with Valentine from the fourth century, already from that time onward. And right from the beginning, this celebration had more to do than just a celebration of romantic love. And the church's commitment to Valentine to honor this example of Christian marriage and sacrifice and martyrdom and the healing of other people and the spread of the gospel was from the beginning a commitment to what Christian marriage could be like in our world and the message that it brings to a broken world. Valentine's Day represents more than flowers and candy. It's about what's in our hearts and the heart of Christ. When we see those hearts on Valentine's Day, we can remember that that heart is, also has some connections back to the heart of Jesus and to God's love for us. And we can remember that the source of all love and the source of self-sacrifice and, and love for each other is rooted in God's love uh, and, in the, and in the witness that St. Valentine actually made for that love. For Christians, Marriage is more than just a union between a man and a woman. For Christians, marriage is a holy parable of the love of Christ towards His church. It's a visible sermon about what holiness and purity could look like in our lives. We should celebrate what true sacrificial love looks like in a broken world. And ultimately, it should be a day that we celebrate the commitment of Christ who gave His life for His church. It should be a day of evangelism. It should be a day where we celebrate the power of true love to change our world. It is a Christian holiday. And that's the source, and that's the real history, that Valentine's Day is a celebration of the sacrament of marriage, that in the face of persecution, in the face of a, an empire saying, you cannot do this, uh, a man took it upon himself to say, no, I want to follow the commands of God. I want to provide a place for Christians to find marriage, to find union. Isn't a wonderful story? 
and it's a story for our children, for our grandchildren. It's not a box of chocolates. It's a celebration of a sacrament. Well, you can find the story of St. Valentine on the CBN Family app. Check out our special section dedicated to Valentine's Day. You'll also find stories of romance and marriage, recipes, crafts for the kids, tips for singles, plus a romantic fireplace, music, and more. And best of all, it's all free. All you have to do is download the CBN Family app uh, on your television. That's probably the best way to watch it. But you can also get it on your smartphone or your tablet. Terry? Well, still ahead, 3,000. That's the number of books Mark Batterson read before he began to write his first book. What's the key to the success of this prolific author and pastor? He's going to tell us himself that's coming up. Plus, meet a single mom who didn't know where her family's next meal was coming from. Where did she find help? And what amazed her about it? You'll see it for yourself after this. This year, celebrate Valentine's Day with your CBN family. Join us on the CBN Family app for stories of romance, encouragement, and how the holiday began. Be sure to catch my favorite brownie recipe. And Gizmo Ghostina has a Valentine craft for the kids. Plus, you'll find some romantic dinner music just for you. Get it all on the CBN Family app, February 5th through the 14th. Hi, we hope you enjoyed this. Please subscribe to our channel so we can bring you more of the content you like. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Top Republicans and some Democrats in New York are blasting Governor Andrew Cuomo after the New York Post reported one of his top aides privately apologized to Democratic lawmakers for withholding the real number of COVID nursing home deaths, saying they feared the Trump administration would use those numbers against them. Some Republicans want Cuomo impeached or investigated for the cover-up. One Democratic state sen uh, senator tweeted, because of your decisions, thousands of people died who did not have to. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing has helped a widow in the wake of a deadly personal tragedy. Agnes and her husband, Joseph, lived with their children in Kenya. They were expecting their third child when terrorists killed Joseph and left Agnes all alone. A recent surgery left her unable to work, and a drought that destroyed crops on her small farm made it a struggle to feed her children. But thanks to gifts from its supporters, Operation Blessing set up a small store for her in the local shopping center. The micro enterprise gave her a life-saving source of income, now able to support her children on her own. A grateful Agnes said, I want to say a big thank you and may God bless you. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting OB.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. Angela Perkins had no idea where her next meal was coming from. Her daycare business had dwindled and she had two young boys to feed. So where did Angela turn for help? Well, you're about to find out. Angela Perkins is a single mom who loves spending time with her boys. My kids are four and six. We do a lot of activities together. One of them is like my science guy, Bryson. He loves doing like experiments. A couple years ago, Angela started her own in-home daycare, but when enrollment numbers dwindled, bills piled up. It's been very difficult financially. I didn't know where we would have our next complete meal. To have to be in a position like that and have children to support at the same time, it made me feel bad as a single mom. When a friend told Angela about Operation Blessing Partner Warehouse of Hope, she was astounded by what she discovered. My first time coming, I was amazed by the amount of food that they gave me. I was just like, whoa, to get things, name brand things, in bulk. It was mind blowing. And just to be able to put a whole meal together and not break the bank to do it, <laughs> it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Now Angela has a stable job working remotely. 
She says she's grateful to Operation Blessing Partners for helping her get back on her feet. I appreciate everything that you all are doing. It's such a blessing. You never know how you affect other people's lives. And for me to have somebody support me and my family and my children and other people's children, there's no words that can express how I truly feel about that. And those words of thanks go to you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. You're part of generously providing where we don't want to just give a handout. We want to help people, and we want to do it very tangibly in ways that they know, they understand, and most importantly, they know that they're being loved. They know that God loves them. They know that you love them because you were willing to say yes I'll help people in need. In this time of pandemic and all of the economic uncertainty, there are lots of unemployed Americans who need help. And how can we help them? Well, one of the best ways is to make sure we can put food on the table, that they can have food in their time of need. If you want to be a part of it, here's a very simple way to do it. Join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day, and you're joining with tens of thousands of people that say, yes, I want to make a difference. Now, a portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes in the work of Operation Blessing. We now have over 4,000 ministry partners who are providing food to people in need across America. You can be a part of all of that by just saying, yes, I'll do my part. I'll give $20 a month. If that's you, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. When you call to join, I want you to have this. It's a wonderful book by my father called I Have Walked with the Living God. It's his testimony of how God has seen him through the good times, through the bad times, through his mistakes. He's very honest about how he missed things, but how God always redeemed, always restored always provided a way. It's yours when you join. It's $20 a month. Call us. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, stress less and accomplish more. Here's the deal. All you have to do is kiss the wave, eat the frog, and seed the clouds. Pastor and author Mark Batterson explains how to win the day every day right after this. One thing that eight-year-old Kimberly began to notice that her right eye was getting blurry. The doctor told me she had a cataract that needed to be removed. As a single mom, Carla wondered how she could raise enough money to pay for an operation. Kimberly woke up and discovered that she was now totally blind in her right eye. He said she now needed two separate operations. I asked God with all my heart to heal her. Operation Blessing arranged for Kimberly to receive both eye surgeries for free. Now I can see again. You have no idea how much I thank you. People around the world need your help. When you partner with CBN, you rescue children and adults from despair, and you give them a promising future. Please watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. When we all come together to help, Miracles happen. Twenty books. That's how many New York Times best-selling author Mark Batterson has written. And before Mark wrote his first book, get this, he had already read 3,000 books. Take a look. As a best-selling author of 20 books and lead pastor of National Community Church in D.C., Mark Batterson knows a few things about achieving goals. You have to seed the clouds. You have to sow today what you want to see tomorrow. In his brand new book, Win the Day, Mark explores seven daily habits he says will help us stress less and accomplish more. Hi, Mark. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Great to have you with us. 
Thank you, Terry. Good to be with you. You know, we're not that far past January 1st when many of us make resolutions about things we want to change or do in our lives, but most of us have unresolved problems, unachieved goals, maybe bad habits we'd like to break. Why is it so hard to accomplish what we want? Well, I, I think it's because when you think in one-year timelines, it's overwhelming, Terry. Uh, 75% of New Year's resolutions fail in the first month. And so what we need to do is take those goals and reverse engineer them into daily habits. And then we need to ask ourselves the question, can you do it for a day? And I hope that's encouraging to everybody listening. Anybody can do anything for a day. And so we've got to live in these day tight compartments. And of course, this is a very biblical idea. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the day that the Lord has made. His mercies are new every morning. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. And so when the day is really about learning to live in these day tight compartments. You know, I, I've written a little bit. You've written a lot. Why did you read 3,000 books before you began writing? Well, when I was 22, Terry, I felt called to write, but I took a graduate assessment that showed a low aptitude for writing. In other words, whatever you do, don't write books. And uh, aren't you grateful that God doesn't call the qualified? He qualifies Amen. the called. And so, um, hey, can I have a little bit of fun? Uh, this is my strong hand. Everybody has a strong hand. And God wants to use you at your point of giftedness. He gave you those gifts. But this is my weekend, Terry. And God's power is made perfect in weakness. So sometimes yeah. God wants to use us at a place where we aren't naturally gifted, but then God anoints us and he uses us. So Terry, when I write books, I take off my shoes because it's holy ground yeah. and I don't just type on a keyboard. I feel like I obey God with the 26 letters of the English alphabet. Yeah. In your latest book, uh, you discuss seven ways to stress less and achieve more. I love the titles of your chapters. One of them is Kiss the Wave. What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, it's habit number two, and it's something that Charles Spurgeon said. He said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Uh, you have to learn the lesson. You have to cultivate the character. You have to curate the change during those tough times. All of us know people who have been following Christ for 25 years, but they don't have 25 years of experience. They have one year of experience repeated 25 times. And so, Terry, a couple of years ago, my wife uh, had a little battle with breast cancer. She's doing great. But she came across a piece of poetry that posed a question. And the question was this, what have you come to teach me? And so when you find yourself in those difficult situations, the waves of life are crashing into you. You have to ask that question. You have to kiss the wave that throws you against the rock of ages. Well, let me jump to another one that kind of I hadn't even read the chapter, but it just made me go. Ooh. What does it mean to eat the frog? Well, it's habit number three. And Mark Twain said, if you ever have to eat a live frog, do it first thing in the morning, because <laughs> then you'll know that the hardest thing is behind you, which is absolutely hilarious, but is a wonderful principle. You know, well begun is half done. And so what I try to do in that part of the book is help us deconstruct and reconstruct some of our morning rituals and routines uh, so that we can eat the frog first thing in the morning. And it gives us momentum for the rest of the day. Talk about seed the clouds. How do we do that? Well, you can't break the law of sowing and reaping. It will make or break you. There aren't any shortcuts. There aren't any cheat codes. And so, so uh, seeding the clouds is about making sure that we're sowing what we want to see more of. And Terry, 
I mean, we find ourselves in a place in history, a cultural moment where there's so much racial tension, political polarization, uh, this COVID crisis that we're fighting. Listen, let's make sure that as followers of Christ, we're standing in the gap as peacemakers, grace givers, tone setters, that we are sowing seeds of faith hope and love. Why? Because we're here for such a time as this. We are here for such a place as this. Well, I love the new book. It's full of wisdom. And friends, I think you're going to love it too. You'll want to hear about all seven of Mark's daily habits. They'll help us all to stress less and accomplish more. And isn't that what we'd like to do? So be sure to get a copy of the book. It's called Win the Day. It's available wherever books are sold. And Mark, it's always great to have you on the program with us. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Bless you. Gordon. Well, coming up, 15 years of crushing back pain and a litany of treatments that never worked. So how was this woman healed in an instant without ever leaving her house? Find out right after this. Hi folks, this is Pat Robertson, and I wanna thank you for watching The 700 Club. Now make sure to click the subscribe button below so you'll never miss an episode. The team at CBN always reads and responds to your comments and prayer requests, so keep them coming. Pain patches, electrotherapy, injections, acupuncture, Joe Dixon tried everything in this arsenal for relief of back pain. Nothing worked for 15 years. So how did she get healed in an instant right in her own home? Take a look. Hi, I'm Joe. I just enjoy playing with my dogs. I have two sweet puppies. I just enjoy things outside. The pain in my back started about 15 years ago when I do things, play with the dogs or, or go out and work in my yard, um, want to go and just walk. Um, I'd have to sit down in between all of it. I couldn't enjoy it as much. I'd bend over and it was excruciating. It was really bad. The doctor, they decided to send me to pain therapy. They did everything from giving me patches, putting electrodes on my back. They put um, injections in my back. We did acupuncture. Nothing ever seemed to work. I was just tired of this. I was so fed up with having the pain. On September 1st, I was watching the 700 Club and Wendy was praying. You have lower back pain that has just plagued you for years, and God is healing you right now. This Today is your day, just receive it. You are healed, and that pain will not be there anymore in Jesus' name. It was exciting, and I'm going, that is me, thank you. And I just kept saying, it's me, thank you, Jesus. I felt the pain leaving. It just sort of left, and um, <laughs> I get I get really excited about it. I'm just telling everybody. It hadn't been there now in quite a while, and I thank him every morning when I get up. I just, it's all because of Jesus. He just was there, and I was there at the right time and accepted at the right time. I can do anything that I didn't do before. I just want to thank the Lord. I know He can do anything, and I can do anything with Jesus. I feel so good, so good. You're suffering. Wouldn't it be wonderful to feel good, to be so good, to feel healed, to know that you're in health? Well, that's what God wants for you. The Bible's quite clear that he wants your, you to be in health uh, and, and to prosper just as your soul prospers. He is vitally interested in everything about you. 
Now, when we start understanding that, start grasping that, some wonderful things open up for us. Our senses, and I don't know what it is about the human condition, our senses want to say, well, let's go hide from God, um, or God's not interested in me, or I hope God doesn't look at me. These things really dominate our thoughts. I mean, even where we can get a physical reaction that, that we want to run and hide. And it's just exactly what Adam and Eve did after they ate of the fruit. They, they wanted to, to go hide. Interesting question from God, where are you? As if God didn't know. And so answer that question, where are you? When God is searching for you, are you right there? For Joe, she finally realized he's right here. He's, he's here. He's with me. He's near me. In him, I live and move and have my being. He doesn't have to call out, where are you? Because God, he's not looking for the answer there. What he's looking for is the realization in you, on your part that he's right there. That's what he's trying to get you to acknowledge, that you, you can't hide from him. He knows. So why not come to him? Why not spread your needs before him? Why not pour out your complaint? Why not receive forgiveness and healing and restoration? Why not? He's right there. He's just a prayer away. Jesus announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your thinking, as a Greek word, metanous, sometimes it's translated repent, but the real meaning, change your thinking and believe the good news. So what do you need to change your thinking about? God loves you. God's not mad at you. God wants you to come and sit in his presence and receive everything that he has for you. Change your thinking and believe the good news. The good news that Jesus came for you. He died for you. He forgives you. He restores you. He heals you. He does all of these things for you. And he's right there. All you have to do is receive it. Now, we're going to pray. Before we pray, we've got some other miracle stories. And, and the reason we tell these testimonies is it's scriptural, but it encourages you to believe that this is for you. It breaks through doubt and unbelief so that you can believe. So here's Arlene from California. She had pain in her right kidney for two weeks, no relief in sight. She was watching the 700 Club. Terry said, someone has kidney issues. Be healed. In Jesus' name, it's gone. And then I followed, it's in your right kidney. It's inflamed, and you're having terrible pain. God has healed you. He's taken all of it away. You felt the touch go into your right kidney. You were being healed and set free. When Arlene heard the words right kidney, she jumped up. The lingering pain and tenderness was gone. Don't you love the specificness of that? Well, here's another one like it. For months, Catherine of Chesney, South Carolina, suffered from a serious health issue relating to her blood flow and heart. She and her husband were watching this program, and Gordon, you prayed someone with a blood disorder. It means you have a chronically low oxygen count. God's healing you now. He's restoring proper red blood cells. He's able to heal things at the cellular level. He's able to heal things at the nucleus of the cell so that it reproduces properly. Let your blood be cleansed and be whole and carry oxygen properly throughout your body. Catherine's husband turned to her and said, Cat, that's for you. She claimed it. God healed her. <laughs> claim it right now. We'll pray. You claim it. Jesus is right there. He will do the healing. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and we ask you to stretch forth your hand to do signs and miracles Touch people's bodies now. Cleanse their lungs. Heal that right kidney, Lord God. Heal any kidney disease right now. Heal all the digestive orders now in the name of Jesus. Terry, God's given us. Yeah, there's someone named Leslie. This is not about an illness. It's about relationships in your family mm -hmm. that you are praying desperately for. God is in the process of working and healing all of that. Listen carefully for his leading. 
Jesus is at work. There's someone with a neck injury, you're in a halo um, mm -hmm. brace, and, and God is able to knit that together. You're being healed right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. If you've been healed, let us know. 1 800 700 7000. Here's a word teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We'll see you next week. God bless. It's like a double punch. You get to COVID, then you get to hurricane. People have lost just about everything, business too. There's been no electricity now for days. We had to stand in long lines to get food for COVID and everything, and then this hit. Pastor Jerry Snyder and his wife Hope partnered with Operation Blessing to host a food and supplies distribution at their church. We're giving out fresh produce. We're giving out products that they need to clean. We're giving out food, trash bags, dog food, all the things that they need. Thank you, Operation Blessing. Thank you, every partner that sows, that gives, that cares. We feel it right here in Southwest Louisiana. Thank you. People around the world need your help. When you partner with CBN, you rescue children and adults from despair, and you give them a promising future. Please watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. When we all come together to help, miracles happen.